Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Moths of Kentucky webinar with Shelby Fulton. Uh, this is the second webinar of a series that we're doing to highlight our region's biodiversity and ecology here in Kentucky. Uh, we have a number of other webinars um, coming up. Uh, on July 28th, we have the myth of pre-settlement uh, Eastern deciduous forest with Rob Prattley from UK and some other ones that are not yet on our um, online calendar, but from September through November, we have some webinars coming up on fungi, trees for butterflies, native peoples of bluegrass and lichens 101. Um, but today we're gonna to be talking about moths. And uh, for those of you who have not been to Flora Cliff before, we're just gonna do um, a brief introduction. So we are a nonprofit nature sanctuary in Fayette County in the Kentucky River Palisades region. Uh, we were founded by uh, Dr. Mary Wharton. She was a botanist and started purchasing land in the late 1950s and it took her about 30 years to acquire 287 acres. And she was very much conservation minded and she wanted the land to be uh, protected but also used for education and research. So in her will, uh, she specified uh, that the preserve only be open for a guided hike and that it be restricted primarily to education and research usages with recreation and inspiration usages only when keeping the area unspoiled. So that guides everything that we do today. Uh, we focus on protecting, restoring, and sharing nature in the bluegrass uh, with protecting the uh, 287 acres that Mary Wharton acquired is a dedicated state nature preserve, which happened in 1996. And um, our uh, speaker today, Shelby Fulton, works with the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. So they have been our partner for a number of years now, and she'll tell you more about what they do. Uh, in 2017, we acquired an additional 59 acres, bringing our acreage up to 346. Um, and that uh, addition was protected with a conservation easement through the Kentucky Heritage Land Conservation Fund. So uh, much of our uh, land is along the Kentucky River, and we also have um, Elk Lake Creek here, which flows uh, through the sanctuary. Uh, most of it's forested. And uh, we, a lot of what we do is to um, kind of document uh, the native biodiversity that's there so that we can um, better manage the land. We do a lot of restoration work. Um, my coworker, Josie Miller, is our stewardship director. So she leads uh, stewardship and invasive species removal uh, throughout the preserve. We focus on amber honeysuckle, garlic mustard, um, a number of different invasives to um, just better protect the resources that we have there. Uh, and she also coordinates our uh, volunteers. Uh, typically, we have about 1,200 visitors a year that attend a variety of different programs on trees and wildflowers, um, ecology, uh, geology, a number of different things. Um, but of course, that changed um, kind of recently because of COVID-19. So we, um, you know, kind of shut down for a while, um, but we have started to uh, bring back our volunteers and also uh, have started guided hikes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, these are private tours uh, that people can sign up for so that they know exactly who they're hiking with. Um, so we're gonna be doing that for the next little bit until we feel um, more comfortable getting back into um, some of those educational tours. But right now we're doing these webinars and we've been really encouraged um, by the response. So we thank everybody uh, that is joining us today. Um, so our speaker, Shelby, she's going to be taking over uh, the screen here um, from, from this point on. Uh, we've been working with Shelby Fulton since uh, 2016. Uh, so she co-taught a two-day workshop on moths uh, that was held at Flora Cliff and Maywoods in Gary County. Uh, and since then, um, she has led the documentation of moths at Flora Cliff and identified most of our moth diversity. Um, so thanks to her, we know we have at least 241 moths and that number increases every time she comes out and she does a survey. So last year we had a moth night um, during National Moth Week and uh, Shelby identified 100 species just in one night. So we're gonna be doing that again um, soon and uh, look forward to what we discovered then. So we'll turn things over to Shelby. Thank you, Shelby. And I guess one other thing that we should mention is just some housekeeping stuff. Um, Josie is joining us as well as um, one of the panelists and she and I will be uh, looking at um, the questions that are coming in. Um, there will be maybe a pause or two during the presentation for you to ask questions and you can submit the questions through the Q&A feature and then Josie and I will um, kind of relay those to Shelby and then we'll have time for more questions at the end. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, this is my first webinar, full disclosure. So 
go easy on me. So as Beverly said, I will be providing an introduction to the Moth Diversity of Kentucky. Um, my email address is up on screen here. So if you have any questions you think of after the webinar has ended, feel free to reach out to me. And I will come back to the screen sometime before the end so you can write down my email if you hadn't done that already. First of all, I have to quickly run through some of the duties of the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. I won't read these all out to you. They are listed on our website if you're interested in looking at them in more detail. But we have a variety of duties having to do with conservation, stewardship, and biological inventories throughout the state of Kentucky. We own land all across the state in the form of our dedicated state nature preserves and natural areas. Our natural areas funded by the Heritage Land Conservation Fund, uh, collaborative projects with the Heritage Land Conservation Fund, and also our Wild Rivers Corridor. In total, we have conserved over 25,000 acres in the state. Our agency is involved with conservation and management activities, including invasive species removal, prescribed fire, things of that nature. Biological assessment, which is what I do for my career, um, which involves going out to various properties and documenting the biota that occur there, as well as community types. We also are very passionate about environmental education and recreation on our sites. We all get involved in working with the public and it's one of the best parts of what we do as an agency. This slide won't apply to most of you, but we do have a biological assessment tool you can access on our website, which is used primarily by consultants and other professionals who are interested in determining whether rare species or community types might occur in a given project site. If you're interested in more information, see our website. Okay, now that that's over, I'm going to jump right in and we'll start basic. What is an insect? Insects have a chitinous exoskeleton. They have three body segments, which is the head in blue, the thorax in orange, and the abdomen, which is shown in green. This is just a caricature of a generic insect, and you'll notice that it has three pairs of legs for six total legs, and one pair of antenna. Typically, insects also have two pairs of wings, but there are exceptions. There are a number of insects that have no wings at all and some that have one pair. So this is our generic model of an insect. Now, what is Lepidoptera? Lepidoptera is the order of insects that includes butterflies and moths. The word Lepidoptera comes from the Greek root words meaning scale and wing. What distinguishes Lepidoptera from other insects are the fine scales shown here that make up the wing. If you've ever heard the myth that uh, holding a butterfly by the wings will cause it to never fly again because you see that dust rub off on your hands, what's actually rubbing off are these tiny microscopic, um, submicroscopic scales. It's also, incidentally, not true that a butterfly can no longer fly. Uh, scales are shed naturally throughout their life. Now, this order includes, as I said, butterflies and moths. And there are nearly 13,000 species in North America, although there are many undescribed species. So it's an incredibly diverse group. Here in Kentucky, we've documented over 2,600 species. And again, there are many undescribed even here. You can see in this diagram the head in blue, the thorax in orange, and the abdomen in green. So they follow that basic um, insect form that we expect. There are three pairs of legs, two pairs of antenna, and two sets of wings, the fore wings and hind wings. You may be wondering about the difference between butterflies and moths. And it's not always as straightforward as you might expect. There are a lot of myths surrounding the differentiation of butterflies and moths. 
One common myth is that moths fly at night and butterflies fly during the day. But in reality, there are numerous exceptions to this rule. For example, this is a question mark butterfly that was observed around 3 a.m. And this individual is resting, but butterflies do occasionally come to artificial light. And here you can see what's called a snowberry clearwing moth. It is sometimes mistaken for a butterfly, but it's actually a day flying moth in the Sphinx family. There's also a myth that moths always hold their wings flat or at their sides, whereas butterflies hold their wings up above the body. While this is sometimes true, again, there are numerous exceptions. This is a white dotted prominent moth resting with its wings at the sides. But this moth here is a bent line carpet holding its wings closed above the body. Now this moth doesn't always do this, but it is possible for many taxa. And here you see a juvenile's dusky wing resting with its wings flat. So going by this rule, you might assume that this dusky wing is a, is a moth when in fact, it is closer to the butterflies. There's also a very unfortunate myth that moths are dull and drab, but butterflies are brightly colored. But they're an incredibly diverse group and they come in all sizes, colors, and patterns you could imagine. All four moths shown here are extremely charismatic and they're all very common in Kentucky. So if none of those things are quite true, what is the difference between a butterfly and a moth? Like I've hinted at, it's not always that clear. Moths are paraphyletic, which means that the moth group doesn't contain all the descendants of its last common ancestor. If you haven't seen something like this since high school, let's walk through it quickly. This is showing the butterflies evolutionarily are shown in blue and moths are shown in green and orange. You can see that the blue butterfly group is nested within the evolutionary history of the full Lepidoptera order. It has moths on either side of it. So this, this is really interesting and this gets at the idea that this distinction isn't as clear as we would like. We would like to see all of the moths on top or on the bottom and the butterflies being truly distinct, but they're nested. So what this really means is that moths are best defined as the Lepidoptera that aren't butterflies. Some languages like French and Spanish refer to all Lepidoptera as butterflies or specify moths as nighttime butterflies. One thing you can look at to tell if you're looking at a moth or a butterfly is the antenna. Butterflies like this giant swallowtail shown on the left of the screen have clubbed antenna. Whereas the antenna of moths can be much more variable, but they should not be clubbed. As always, there are exceptions to this rule, but the exceptions pretty much occur in the tropics. So in Kentucky, you should not run into moths that have clubbed antenna. So for Kentucky, this rule should work. One thing I always like to address is why moths are even important. For one thing, moths can be pollinators of both crops and wild plants. They're an important food source for vertebrate and invertebrate predators. My background is in the relationship between moths and bats. So the importance of moths in the diet of our bats. And many of our bats are imperiled due to a fungus called white nose syndrome. And it's important that moths and other insects are retained on the landscape to serve as a food source for this imperiled and vulnerable group of vertebrate predators. Moths and insects in general are also important surely because they represent such a large proportion of biomass in the environment. I think we all know how incredibly abundant 
bugs are on the landscape. And because they make up such a large proportion, uh, dramatic changes that might occur in overall insect abundance could have devastating cascading effects. Moths are also important because they cause positive and negative ecological impacts. Caterpillars are frequent crop pests. They can also be indoor pests, particularly of stored grains, but they cause all kinds of positive impacts as well. And both for their positive and negative impacts, they certainly are important to human lives. How we talk about moths is another interesting topic that some of you may not have thought about. I've already introduced the idea of Lepidoptera existing as an insect order. So when we talk about moths, the order Lepidoptera is the top level. Within that order Lepidoptera, we have families as a subunit of that order. Below families, we have subfamilies. There are other uh, distinctions below the subfamily level, but we're not going to get into that today, just for simplicity's sake. So nested within subfamilies, we have our individual species. So you can see in this chart how it all breaks down, how everything we're going to talk about today is included in Lepidoptera. We'll walk through the different families and some subfamilies towards the end of the presentation as well. One thing we talk about a lot with moths is whether they're micro moths or macro moths. You'll also hear this referred to as micro Lepidoptera and macro Lepidoptera. Just think for a minute about these images on screen. I have the, the approximate wingspans shown. Think about what you would consider a macro moth, a large moth, versus a micro moth or a small moth. I'll tell you, it's sort of a trick question. Just like the distinction between butterflies and moths, the distinction between micro and macro moths isn't actually that great. The largest moth I showed you on screen is actually a micro lepidoptera. And this is because the difference between micro and macro actually has more to do with evolution than it does size. When we say micro lepidoptera or micro moths, we are usually referring to very tiny moths, but more importantly, those tiny moths are very primitive. They are some of the moths that evolved earlier. And that's why you do sometimes end up with these oddball micro moths that are very large, but are still considered micro lepidoptera. You can see the micro moths shown in orange and the macros are shown on the right side of the screen in green. Another thing you'll see commonly discussed in moth circles are the Mona or Hodges numbers. A Mona number is a unique numerical identifier assigned to every species of moth or butterfly known in North America, north of Mexico. These numbers originated in the publication by Ron Hodges, the checklist of Lepidoptera of America, north of Mexico. And this is incredibly useful because the taxonomy of Lepidoptera changes all the time. So, I have included here a screenshot from one of the newer checklists that came out in 2016. If you take the first species on the list, which is Dasakira tephra, you can see that it has the number on the right, 8292. That means that no matter what happens to the taxonomy of the species, if 20 years from now somebody decides it's a different species, you will still be able to find it by that number, even if you don't know what the new name is, but you know the old name or you know the number, 
you can cross-reference these things together and keep track of what species you're talking about. And this is very common. Things move from one group to the other or from one species to the other all the time. So having this numerical system to identify moths um, keeps us from having to constantly rememorize new names for things. Let's talk about how we can observe moths. As Beverly mentioned, we put this event on as part of National Moth Week. It is, I believe, currently National Moth Week. And it's unfortunate that we're not able to have an in-person event this year due to COVID-19, but it is very easy to DIY your own moth setup. And so I wanna walk you through how to do that. It would be great if all of you would uh, investigate the moths that you might have occurring in your own backyard that you haven't yet experienced. Really any artificial light, including your standard incandescent light bulbs will attract some moths. We've all seen the, uh, the moth to a flame idea. Um, you know, we've all seen moths fluttering around street lights at night or around porch lights. And this is the idea that we can attract moths using artificial light. For best results, a light that has extra UV is generally more productive. Black lights are great, affordable light sources for attracting moths. Um, you can check party stores for these or hardware, home improvement stores, and you can get one very cheaply. But like I said, any light you have will attract some moths. What I recommend is hanging or placing your light in front of a smooth surface because moths will be attracted to the light and they'll settle on whatever surface you're illuminating. That will allow you to photograph them, identify them, and really just get involved in the community. A white cotton sheet is an ideal and cheap backdrop. Apparently it is somewhat important at least that it be cotton because I have been told that cotton reflects more light than um, artificial fibers. I have not tested that myself. Um, I actually use a nylon backdrop and that has always worked for me, but your mileage may vary. So here's my setup and this is a professional setup. Um, Buying everything from the sheet to the light to the battery, this setup would run you about $200, but you can do something similar in your own backyard, either for free using materials you already have or, you know, for 10 bucks. And like I have already discussed, the basic idea here is a black light, a reflective white surface and a power source. That's really all you need. Another thing you can do to attract moths, and this is again another cheap DIY solution, is baiting or sugaring for moths. And I always do this at the same time as I'm running a sheet setup because some species aren't attracted to light, but you can still detect them using sugar bait. Everyone has their own bait recipe. Um, it's the kind of thing where people swear by their personal blend um, everyone thinks they've got the best secret recipe. So you might have to experiment to find your favorite. Typically, moth bait is a mix of rotten or fermented fruit, sugar, molasses, fruit juices, and alcohol. Stale beer is usually what I see people using. And you paint this, just with any old paintbrush, on a tree trunk or other surfaces, but important, it can stain. So if you are worried about staining, do not paint this on your deck. Do not paint it on any prized landscape trees you might have in your yard. It can stain. And in addition to moths, it will attract ants. So, you know, don't do it right by your window or anything like that. Um, pro tip, your bait should be thick about the texture of house paint and not drippy. 
If it's too drippy, it'll drip right down your tree or other surface and it won't stay concentrated enough that anything will be attracted. Here's one classic recipe. Um, I'll give you all a minute if you want to scribble this down, but you can also send me an email and I can um, provide you with this recipe after the webinar if you're interested. This recipe uses three to six overripe bananas and bananas are a great fruit option for moth bait because they help to thicken up the mixture. So if you're halfway through making a batch of bait and you notice it's too runny, um, you can just keep adding bananas until you get the texture you're looking for. They say molasses, corn syrup, honey, sugar, any, anything, any sweetening agent will be fine. The idea here is to end up with something sweet, sticky, and boozy. And notice at the end of the recipe, they recommend that you leave it to ferment in the sun for a few hours. That is actually really important. And the longer you give your bait to ferment, the better the results might be. I will say that I have not personally had the best luck with moth bait. Um, but maybe I just haven't found my own secret recipe yet. There are some important weather considerations if you're choosing a night to look for moths. The darker the night is, the better your results will be. So new moons are great times for looking for moths and cloudy nights. The idea here is that the darker the night is, the more significant your source of light will be. This way you're not competing with the moon or anything like that. Rain is actually not the end of the world as long as it's not a constant driving rain. You will still get moths in between periods of light rain. Wind is the big problem. If it's a windy night, you would expect to see far fewer moths than you would on a still night. So if you can, avoid looking for moths on super windy nights. I have some tips for you for photographing moths because while you're just getting started, you will likely not recognize which moths you're looking at. And so one good way to get identification help is to provide a high quality photograph to someone who has more experience with moths. One thing you'll notice is that a lot of times moths will flutter erratically around your light source. And because they're fluttering and they're moving quickly, you can't get a good photo of them. It's blurry. It's okay. Most often these moths that are fluttering like that will settle down. They, in my experience, they'll flutter around like that for a little bit. If you give them five, 10, 15 minutes, they very frequently will settle nicely on the surface you've illuminated, and then you can photograph them more easily. So don't feel obligated to chase a moth that's flying all over the place. Just ignore it and wait for it to calm down. Moths with wings held towards the side of the body are better photographed from the side because you wanna capture as much of the wing pattern as you possibly can. And this is most commonly the case in very tiny moths. So I have an example for you. Both photos are the same individual and you can see the photo from the left, the shot is taken above the moth and this is not a helpful photo. You can only identify it to the genus level. You can say, yeah, this is a parasa, but from that photo alone, there's no way I could tell what it is. There are two different species that it could be, but I have to see the side of the wing. So on the right is the same individual, but a much more helpful photo. From this photo, I can tell you exactly what species it is. So notice the difference between these two photos, how from the top, it's very narrow. You don't see much of the wings and that's just not a helpful photo. On the right, you've taken it long ways and I can see the whole wing pattern, which allows me to make an identification.
but you should also know that not all moths can be identified from a photograph. So here's some common ones. The first one actually is a moth. It's in the family Pteraphoridae, which are called the plume wing moths. And overall, this entire family can't really be identified from a photograph. You typically have to dissect these moths to get any kind of accurate identification. The second moth is extremely common. Um, if every person in this webinar were to set out a moth sheet this week, I would guess that maybe 70% of you would see this moth. But it could be one of two species. So it's very distinctive. You see it, you know exactly what you're looking at because there's nothing else that looks like it, but it could be one of two species and there's no way to tell it apart from a photograph at all. You would have to dissect it and that is well beyond the scope of today's webinar. Interestingly, this particular moth is very easily distinguished in the caterpillar phase. So some species are like that. Once they're adults, you kind of just have no hope with a photograph. The species on the right could also be one of two species. This is another very common species that many of you could probably see, but yeah, it could be one of two species and size is a big determining factor when you're distinguishing the two species it could be. But typically from a single photograph, you don't have a good idea of scale. Uh, it looks like somebody has asked a question about when you are dissecting moths, what you're looking for. That's a great question. Um, typically when you're dissecting a moth, you're looking at the genitalia. There is a theory called the lock and key hypothesis, which essentially says that the males and females from one species should only be sexually compatible with each other. So the lock, the key should fit the lock. Um, as is so often the case in biology, this doesn't necessarily work so well in practice. We do know that moths can hybridize with each other, which means that um, multiple keys fit one lock. And this does complicate things, but in general, when you are working on a really tricky identification, um, you are dissecting the abdomen to view the genitalia. And for certain moths, that is the only way you can tell them apart. I will also note that that is not a skill of mine, um, but that just goes to show that with insects, there's always something new to learn. If you do put up a moth sheet, I wanna walk you through some of the other things you'll see because it's not just moths that are attracted to light. Many invertebrates are attracted to light. You will also attract predatory invertebrates that are attracted to the free dinner you're getting at your light sheet. Leafhoppers, which are in the orange border, are extremely abundant. And often they'll be some of the first insects that show up after sunset. That is usually the case for me um, and I have a photo I'll show you here in a minute of hundreds and hundreds of leaf hoppers at a sheet just after sunset. They're very tiny. They're about a millimeter or two long and you'll frequently see them in pale yellow or pale green, but they can have really beautiful patterns. You'll also see caddisflies like the one here outlined in green. They are sometimes abundant. Um, depending on how close to water you are, they have aquatic larvae, uh, and depending on other environmental factors. And sometimes they are easy to mistake for moths. But look very closely. There are a couple things that will help you determine whether it's a moth or a caddisfly. Caddisflies frequently have very long antenna. Some moths have very long antenna, but caddisflies in general will have very long, thin antenna. And if you look really closely at the wings, remember that moths have scales on their wings. That's what makes them Lepidoptera. But caddisflies don't have scales. Instead, they have little hairs scattered across the surface of the wing. 
So somebody is asking um, why moths are attracted to light at night um, and why genus is not on my list of categories. It's not in my diagram because I ran out of space, basically. I ran out of space on the slide. But um, yes, I should have included a note that uh, genus is above species. And when we talk about things like family and genus, we're talking about how closely related things are to each other. So a species is one distinct entity. It is most closely related to other species in the same genus. So that's one level of relatedness. A species is also related to other moths that are in a different genus, and the plural of the word genus is genera, but it's most closely related to other genera within the same family. So it's tiered levels of relatedness, and that's, that's all a genus is. is um, it's one grouping that tells you that, hey, the moths that are in this genus are most closely related to each other, more so than they are to the species in another genus. There are a few different theories on why moths are attracted to light at night. Um, it's not fully resolved, uh, so there, there isn't a singular uh, definitive answer, but one of the most common theories is that um, all of the artificial light that humans have introduced to the landscape is um, confusing to them because they use the moon to orient themselves in space. And the idea is that by introducing artificial light, uh, you're confusing them and they, they don't have the programming to figure out what to do next when they reach the light source. Because if they're flying to the moon or away from the moon, you know, that there's no destination there. They can never reach the moon, um, but they can reach an artificial light. And so the thought is that they don't have the programming for what to do next. And that's why they kind of hang out at a light and don't move on. So that's one of the more common theories. So if you're running a moth sheet, in addition to leaf hoppers and caddis flies, you will also find beetles and spiders and all kinds of other critters. All right, here's that photo I was talking about. I took this photo last week, right after sunset, just as it started to get really dark, and every little green or yellowish speck you see in this photo is a leafhopper. And this night had a particular abundance of leafhoppers. We were in a really grassy, fieldy area, and these guys love that. So this is just a snapshot of a very small section of my sheet. And it was really just covered in leafhoppers. So uh, if you're interested in doing this, expect to see a lot of these guys. Here's what a sheet looks like um, late at night. This photo was probably taken around midnight. And you can see a variety of bugs all over the sheet, including a number of moths. So um, this is something you will most likely encounter. If you've been following the news, you've probably heard a lot of buzz about insect declines, um, declines in pollinators, things like that. And this is certainly a concerning topic. People talk a lot about how, you know, in the 70s or in the 80s, um, they'd put up a sheet for moths and it would be just covered in moths. And now you get something like the photo I showed you where you've got 50 moths somewhere in that ballpark. Um, so what's going on? As with so many vulnerable animal groups, habitat loss is a big issue. Urbanization, agriculture, unsuitable land management in general has led to declines in Lepidoptera. We know this 
for a fact that changes in habitat structure and host plant availability and nectar sources all contribute to why it might be more difficult for butterflies and moths to succeed in today's modern world. Non-native plants, insects, and pathogens are also a concern. These can lead to changes in habitat structure. So think about the bug called the hemlock woolly adelgid. If you've never heard of this, it's an itty bitty little critter that looks kind of like a puff of cotton. Um, it's just a little white fluff ball on the leaves of hemlock trees. And they infest the trees in large numbers, ultimately resulting in the death of the tree. This is really problematic, especially in eastern Kentucky, where forests have such a heavy hemlock component. So when these hemlocks start to die, the forest fundamentally changes. And even though the hemlock woolly adelgid isn't directly interacting with these moths in any way, it causes a change in habitat structure. And that can cause certain moth species who relied on that hemlock forest to decline as well. There are also various non-native insects and pathogens that directly impact Lepidoptera. Um, we won't get into that too much, but it, it does happen. You can also run into issues with chemical and biological control for these non-native organisms. Um, particularly, I'm talking about pesticides, um, and particularly, I'm talking about control of the non-native gypsy moth. Gypsy moths do occur in Kentucky. They're seen every now and then, but they're really not established here. Uh, we don't have outbreaks in Kentucky, which is great news. Gypsy moths are a problem because the caterpillars occur in huge numbers, and they um, are a generalist species, so they will eat any kind of tree they can get their little hands on, but they especially like oaks, um, and so that would be a huge concern to have massive gypsy moth outbreaks impacting our oaks and changing the forest structure. Yeah, somebody has asked um, if I have heard of people not seeing as many butterflies this summer. I have definitely had the same experience. I've had a few different people reach out to me over the last few weeks in particular to ask what's going on. Um, and I, I've had people from other professionals to um, amateurs to people for, with all kinds of involvement in entomology reaching out to me about this issue. And definitely I have seen far fewer butterflies this season than in past seasons. My theory is that, um, you know, we had a really mild winter, but then we had a really late hard frost. Many insects, when they overwinter, they are set to wake up based on temperature. And so I think that because it was such a mild winter, maybe things started to emerge, um, you know, a little early in the spring, maybe even a little earlier in the spring than they usually do. But then we had that late hard frost that kind of knocked them back. So that's, that's my theory for now. Um, yeah, you're not seeing as many black swallowtails. Um, that, that's definitely something I have seen this season for sure. So um, you can attribute part of that to natural yearly variation. Every year is going to be a little bit different and sometimes numbers go up, sometimes numbers go down. There's also an argument to be made for climate change and what impact that could have on our insects. Um, that's something we don't have all the answers for because, you know, we're living it. Um, the data is coming in real time and um, sometimes it can take a while to see those conclusions really come together. Excessive herbivory by deer is another concern for certain moths because caterpillars, caterpillars are sometimes what we call generalists where they'll eat any type of plant, but sometimes they're very specialized and they will only eat one type of plant. Um, and for those species that rely on one type of plant, if you've got an overabundance of deer in an area that are coming through 
and eating up all of that plant, then there's nowhere for the caterpillars to eat and go through their life cycle. Excessive deer herbivory can also change habitat structure and affect species that are generalists. You know, they can eat up, say, all of the regenerating oak seedlings or something like that, affecting what that next generation of forest trees is going to look like. For some species, overcollection and poaching is another problem. This typically is an issue more so with butterflies than moths, but for very attractive species that are sought after by collectors, um, an irresponsible collector can really do damage to a small population of a species that's barely hanging on. It's sort of outside the scope of today's talk, but it is more than possible to collect insects responsibly for scientific, educational, or personal purposes, but, you know, it has to be done responsibly to prevent impacts to the population. If you impact the population negatively, you could be affecting that species' ability to persist in a location into the future. And this is why sometimes you run into people um, who are very hesitant to talk to you about things they've seen. Uh, it, you know, sometimes it can make the insect uh, entomology community seem a little bit unfriendly at times, um, but what's going on here is people are concerned about um, protecting rare populations that they may know of. So if you run into someone who is hesitant to either tell you what they found or more commonly where they found it, they're typically coming from uh, a place of conservation um, or a, a place of wanting to protect a resource that they're aware of. And that's also something to consider when you're taking photos and things like that. Even if you aren't collecting a species, you can still do damage to a population even just by taking a photo. It's really important, you know, if you're out in the woods taking photos of stuff, um, that you leave the area as you left it. Um, be careful where you put your boots, be careful where you're walking, you never know what kind of rare plant might be there that is required by a rare caterpillar or something like that. So um, be mindful of your actions, be mindful of the habitat, and protect that in any way that you can. And when you're posting photos online, make sure, you know, if you've got something really rare, um, it's certainly my recommendation that you not disclose the location if you have something very rare. We do have non-native moths in Kentucky. Uh, many of them are pests, either of crops and trees or of stored grains in your house. Uh, a lot of them came over from Europe and Asia and they're probably not a significant threat to our native moths, at least regarding competition. But like I already mentioned, some non-native moths can cause significant changes to habitat, like the gypsy moth, and chemical and biological control can threaten native moths, although most treatment nowadays is highly targeted. Uh, historically, gypsy moths were controlled with DDT. That's not done anymore. Um, and most chemicals and even biological control agents are highly targeted to gypsy moths, so they don't affect our native moths. But in the past, it has been a concern. Like I mentioned, gypsy moths are sometimes found here, but uh, they're not established or widespread, although they are established in several neighboring states. So we've been really lucky here so far. We also have non-native moths that are accidentals um, and they're not truly invasive. So what this means is they occasionally show up in Kentucky, usually from further south, uh, either south regarding the continent or south regarding the United States, but they don't survive the winters here, and so they don't establish a permanent presence. 
these are always really interesting mods to see because they got here naturally. They're not causing a problem, but um, they will not form well-established reproductive populations. All right, let's check this question. Any tips on how to set up a moth catching light? So let me scroll back to, oh, this will work. Um, you know, this is my setup with a black light and a white sheet. Uh, you, can, you can easily do something similar uh, DIY style. So any kind of light you might have will attract some moths. If you're willing to invest maybe 10 bucks, um, a black party light is an ideal option and a white cotton bed sheet. So you can tape or tack a bed sheet to a deck or a door, an outside door, um, anything like that. And you can either find a way to hang a light you know, with a, a bungee cord maybe, um, or you can just place the light on the ground in front of the sheet and you will get some illumination on the sheet. And I use an external battery. So my battery is, um, I think it's like a lawnmower battery. Um, that's one option. Some people use generators. If you're doing this in your backyard, probably the easiest option for you would be just an extension cord to go to whatever outdoor outlet you might have. You can even get some black lights that are um, powered by double A's or triple A's. Um, so that's an option too. Yeah, mercury vapor light. That's, that's an interesting point. So um, some Moth enthusiasts prefer to use a type of light called a mercury vapor light or a mercury vapor lamp. Um, I'm a little bit intimidated by those as well, to be perfectly honest. They, they um, are more prone to exploding <laughs> or catching fire than um, regular incandescent or fluorescent or LED lights. And um, they also have some skin and eye exposure issues, which UV lights do too, don't get me wrong. Um, but I, I have not invested in a mercury vapor lamp uh, <laughs> for those reasons either. Some people insist that mercury vapor lamps are better. Some say that, well, they're not better, they're just different and you can get different kinds of moths. Um, and I think that would be a really cool study someday to have someone set up you know, a sheet like this and have one with a mercury vapor lamp and maybe a mile away do one with a black light and compare. Um, I think that would be really cool to look at. But yes, there is a third type of light, the mercury vapor light. Um, but if you're wanting to do this yourself on the cheap, I think a black party light would be the way to go. So I've got someone asking if you can use bait and a light, if you could put the bait on the sheet. I don't know. Um, I've never tried that. I would imagine, um, I would imagine you might run into a couple problems. So if you use like a, a vinyl or nylon sheet like I do, the bait would not stick to that. It would just slide right down. Um, if you're using a cotton sheet, it would be absorbed at least to some degree. And I'm not sure, um, that it would be accessible enough once it's absorbed to attract moths. The great thing about painting bait on wood, whether that's a plank or a tree, what have you, is that it's not really gonna be absorbed, but the tree bark or the wood has enough texture that the bait is gonna stay in place. That would be my recommendation, but there's a lot of room for experimenting here and finding what works for you. Okay, so I have a list of resources for you all. Bug Guide is a great resource. Uh, it's hosted by a university. I can't think of the university right now. Um, maybe Iowa. 
Um, you can post photos here for ID request, uh, but what I mostly use bug guide for is to view photos for reference. So if I have a moth and I think I have it identified, but I'm not quite sure, I go to bug guide, I type in the species I think it is in the search bar, and I can scroll through a whole gallery of images that other people have taken that are of that species. And then I can compare my photo to those photos and see how it looks. Bug Guide is a website, thank you. So um, I don't know if it would be possible to send this presentation out. Um, I do have these hyperlinked. Uh, you can also just search Bug Guide on Google and it'll pop right up. This is a great resource. Moth Photographers Group is another really great resource. They have photos of moths in the wild, but they also have photos of pin specimens in collections. So you can see a couple different views of whatever moth you're looking for. You can search species in their search bar, but they also have a feature called walk through the moth families. And this is so, so good when you're first learning moths because they'll go family by family, like we're gonna do here in a little bit, and show you some common or charismatic individuals from that family. And you will be able to find many common species that way. This is another website. And with this walk through the moth families feature, it's kind of like a digital field guide. There's also a Facebook group that I would recommend to anyone who's interested in moths, which is called Moths of the Eastern United States. You can post photos there for ID requests, but make sure you read the group rules, um, which are that you post a general location. So this can even just be a county or a state even, uh, and you are supposed to also post the date. They ask that you post the date because that can be really important sometimes to identifying moths, particularly itty bitty ones that are hard to identify on site. Sometimes you're like, well, it could be this one or it could be that one, but that one only flies in October and I saw it in April. And then that lets you know that it's the one species, you know? This Facebook group is great. There are photos coming in all the time. When I was first learning moths, um, what helped me more than anything else was every morning while I had my coffee and breakfast, I would get on this Facebook group and I would just scroll through photos, just scroll through tons and tons of photos and look at the IDs people were giving them uh, until I finished breakfast and coffee. And that went such a long way to helping me learn moths because the best way to learn moths is just to look at a whole lot of moths. Um, and looking at other people's photos is a great way to get that exposure. iNaturalist is another website and, and it has an app um, that is an amazing resource. I'm sure some of you here already use it. It's a citizen science initiative that is used to document occurrences and you can post photos for ID requests and you can use it to store your own observations so you can always look back and see what you saw when. And when you post a photo of a moth on iNaturalist and you tag the location as being somewhere in Kentucky, your photo will automatically be added to a project on iNaturalist that's called uh, Moths of Kentucky. And this week, any moths you post will not only be added to the Kentucky group for moths, but they'll be added to the National Moth Week project. I check iNaturalist all the time, uh, usually multiple times a day to see what moths and butterflies other people in Kentucky are seeing. So if you are, you know, putting up a moth sheet this week and taking photographs and you need some help on identification, the fastest way to get me to look at those for you would be to post them on iNaturalist. You're also more than welcome to email me any photos of moths that you would be interested in having a, a an identification for. Uh, any that you're stuck on, I'm happy to take a look. And um, once again, you can email those to me. You can post them on iNaturalist. I will see them at some point if they're on iNaturalist. Um, I don't know every moth. <laughs> As I already said, we have over 2,600 moth species in the state, Kentucky, and we have many more that are currently undescribed, so they don't even have a name. 
Um, so I definitely don't know every moth in Kentucky. Um, the goal when you're learning moths is never to know them all, um, but rather to know how to find what you're looking at. There's another website here called uh, leps.fieldguide. It's another citizen science initiative, kind of like iNaturalist, but iNaturalist is for any kind of critter. You can post plants, animals, whatever you might find, but this leps.fieldguide is just for moths and butterflies. And I use it mostly as a way to document my own sightings. Um, sometimes people will comment and help you ID things, but not as much as they do on iNaturalist. But I have found that the automatic ID algorithm is usually more accurate than iNaturalist for moths in particular. And if you've never used one of these sites before, what happens when you upload a photo, you can type in the name of the species you think you have, or um, the app or the website will suggest, based on your image, what it thinks the species is. And iNaturalist is pretty good with moths. I would say it's right or almost right, maybe 65, 70% of the time with this leps.fieldguide website. Um, and I think there's an app for this too. I would say their algorithm is usually right 80% of the time. So um, I use both of these personally. They're both really good resources. Uh, I just wanted to highlight again that if you want me to take a look at anything you might see this week, post it on iNaturalist or shoot me an email and I would be happy to look at your photos. There are also a number of books you can get to help you. One of the most popular is this Peterson Field Guide to Moths. Um, I have the Northeastern version. Kentucky is kind of in between geographically. Um, we get moths here from both what Peterson considers the Northeast and the Southeast. So you could get either one of those books and be pretty well covered, but you know, there are some species in Kentucky that are missing from either the Northeast or the Southeast book, um, but either one of these will be a pretty good resource for you. I like this book a lot because it has really great photos of live moths. And that's really cool because some of the older field guides, like this book on the right, um, mostly just have images of pinned specimens. This is a really old book, so the color is a little bit faded. But you can see this has the moths all spread out with their wings out. And that's great, but when you're looking at a live moth that's hanging out on a sheet or on a wall, they never pose like that, never. Um, and so, you kind of have to get into the right headspace of knowing how to mentally convert the image of the pin specimen to what it would look like in life and vice versa. So it can be really helpful to have these books that show photos of them live. That said, the old book, you know, it comes in a, in a blue cover and then the red cover is what I have here. This is by Dr. Charles Covell. He um, is now retired, but he was a professor for a very long time at the University of Louisville and made significant contributions to what we know about moths in the state of Kentucky. This is a great book just to have. It's still widely used, um, particularly for its information about identification. So in addition to the photos, this one is really great about telling you four wing light to dark rusty brown, heavily speckled with blackish or something like that. It also goes into the host plants, the range, things you might confuse them with. You can get that kind of information in the Peterson guides too, but the Covell one just does a really spectacular job. This one's not as easy to find, the, the Covell one is not as easy to find, um, but they're currently um, doing a run of this book at the Virginia Museum of Natural History. So you can get a copy from them if you're interested. There are a couple of other resources that I don't think will apply to as many of you. We have the checklist for Kentucky. This is the Kentucky Book of Moths um, and Butterflies. There are no photos in this. It is not a field guide. It is a checklist. Um, my agency 
Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves publishes this and sells it. Um, but note that it does not have any photos and it is not a field guide. But if you're looking for a list, just a straight up list of moths that have been documented in the state, um, this is a great option. I would say it's a pretty advanced resource though. Uh, I also am a huge fan of this book. This is Caterpillars of Eastern North America by Dave Wagner. And this is a great companion. Um, it has photos and life history information of the caterpillars of all kinds of moths and butterflies. So that's another really good book if you are interested in identifying things while they're in their larval stage. Okay, let's check in and see if anyone has any questions about this first part of the presentation before I move on to uh, the families. Okay, it doesn't seem like we have any right now. Um, we've kind of been addressing them as they come in. Oh, nope, we've got one. Uh, what is the white sheet setup called? Ooh, um, if you're asking about the one that I specifically use, I would have to look into that. Um, I purchased it from BioQuip, which is sort of the premier entomology supplier in the United States. Um, but I will make a note of your name and I can let you know that later. Um, but if you're doing a DIY setup, really just any white cotton sheet from Walmart will work fine. Yeah, the Caterpillar book is really great. Okay, so let's dive into the part that is the most fun, also a little bit scary if you're new to moths, but we'll get through it. I'll say now too that I'm not going through every family we have, I'm just going through the ones that you're more likely to see um, if you're doing this this week. Let's start with Tortricidae. These are very tiny moths. They're a micro moth and they often have rounded shoulders. So if you look at these photos, you can kind of see um, that up by the head, the wings have a rounded shape to them that to me always looks like shoulders. They're really highly variable in color and pattern. Um, many of them are crop pests. This is a really hard group with a lot of undescribed species, but you see them all the time. Um, so look for those rounded shoulders and these are often moths that you want to photograph from the side because they have their wings folded um, next to their abdomens. And I'm going to go through this quickly, but um, I can see about having this sent out after the webinar if you would like to look at it more closely. Uh, and this is also being recorded. This might be my favorite family of moths. This is Crambidae. These come in two common forms. Um, they can be very small and narrow with really long fuzzy mouth parts like this first image. And the ones in this form are often metallic gold or brown and white. Alternatively, they can be little and triangular, either dull or boldly patterned and they sometimes have really gorgeous iridescence to them. These are really common in grassy woodlands, old fields, and some of them actually have aquatic larvae, so they're associated with water features. It is true, there are in fact um, aquatic caterpillars, and they're usually, if not always, in this family. Then we have Pyralidae, another really cool family of tiny moths. These are usually either small and narrow with patterns in grays, oranges, and browns, or little and triangular. And when they're little and triangular, they're very often reddish brown. Some of these are indoor pests of stored grains. 
So if you've ever had little worms or caterpillars in um, a jug of rice or something like that, there's a good chance it was, in the, it was a moth in the family Pyralidae. Oh, another great family. I shouldn't have said that first one was my favorite because I'm going through these and I just love all of them. This is the, the family Limacodidae, also called the slug moths. These guys are little and chunky and they typically hold their wings in a tent-like position over the abdomen. So kind of like that over the abdomen. The legs and the thorax can be really fluffy and sometimes they curl the abdomen upward like in the second and third photo, but not all the time. The larvae are really distinctive um, and they often have stinging spines. So if you've ever been stung by a saddleback caterpillar, it grows up to be one of these guys. Geometridae is the family that gives me the most trouble. They can be small or large. Their wings are usually very thin and spread out widely. They're often gray or brown, but some of them can be green or yellow. They, they often have patterns made up of wavy lines and tiny dots. And when you are identifying species in the family Geometridae, it often comes down to looking very closely at specifically where those wavy lines bend, exactly where those tiny dots are in relation to the wavy lines. And it gets pretty complicated, at least in my opinion. These can be tricky. Some people really get into them though. Some people are just huge fans of geometrids. Saturnids are the ones we all love. You've probably seen a couple of these already. These are medium to very large in size and they're often brightly colored, sometimes with eye spots. Um, so they have these patterns on the wings that kind of look like eyes. And one theory on why they have these is to make them look like they're a bigger animal um, to scare off predators or something like that. These often have robust, fluffy bodies. Um, the best way to identify these is really just by um, noting that you're looking at a really big, chunky moth. The other really big, chunky moths you run into in Kentucky are in the family Sphingidae. These are the sphinx moths. Two common forms here. They either have long pointed wings and a long tapering abdomen, or they look like this third photo and they have a scalloped wing margin in conjunction with their large size. Uh, sphinx moths are really great pollinators of long tubular flowers. They have a really long proboscis that allows them so their mouth part is really long and it lets them get down in those deep flowers to reach nectar. Uh, and during that process, they pollinate the flower. So these are really great moths. The family Nododonidae is very common as well. These are medium sized species. They often have a fluffy crest on their thorax. So you can kind of see this in the first photo, how the hair towards the head kind of sticks up above the body like a mohawk. That's what I'm talking about when I say there's a fluffy crest on the thorax. They often have fluffy legs as well, which you can see in a few of these photos. And these are often associated with mature woodlands. The family Arebidae is, um, when I was first learning moths, one that really gave me trouble, but now I feel like I've got a pretty good handle on. So if you're a little intimidated by this family at first, don't worry, you'll get it in time. The reason this family can be so tricky for new mothers is that they're extremely variable in form, size, and color. There is nothing I can tell you that would make you look at a moth and say, oh, that's definitely an Arebid. Um, I would recommend learning the subfamilies because they can have more in common, you know, because you can see in these four photos I have here, these are different. <laughs> these are really different from each other.
And if you're new at this, it, it, it may not occur to you that these are all in the same family. So we're going to walk through the subfamilies of Arabidae because I think that's a little more helpful. First, you have the subfamily Arctianae. You'll notice that the families all end in I-D-A-E. Um, subfamilies always end in I-N-A-E. And this is just for animals. Plants use a different system. So the subfamily Arctianae, they can be small or very large. They're often very brightly colored, but some of them are pretty drab or snowy white, and they're super variable. There's really not a great single characteristic I can recommend other than just at a certain point you will have looked at enough of these that uh, you recognize them. And I realize that's not satisfying um, and it's not especially helpful, is it? But they're just so variable, guys. Um, one thing that might tip you off is if you're looking at a moth and you say, wow, look how crazy that thing is. That might be a tip off that it's in the subfamily Arctianae in the family Arabidae. There's also the subfamily Hermionae. These are litter moths that are often associated with leaf litter. So when you're walking through the woods and you're kicking up leaf litter and you see little moths start fluttering around once you've stirred them all up, a lot of times they're these moths. They're relatively small. They're usually triangular. They're often gray or brown. So you can see that these are a lot more similar to each other than the last couple slides I showed you. Strongly triangular, grayish brownish. Those are the take home points for this subfamily. There's also the subfamily Hypenonae. These are medium sized. Again, they're triangular, but the difference is these ones often have really bold patterns on the wings and their mouths can be very long and snout like, which you can see in some of these photos. The subfamily Arabinae has some of the most conspicuous moths in our woodlands. These are medium or large. Many of them hold their wings flat. And this subfamily includes the Catocalas, which are the underwings. So the second photo here and the third as well, actually, are both Catocala. Um, you can see when the wings are closed, it's pretty drab, um, very tree barky looking. But when they open their wings, the hind wings, are extremely bright and they can be bright orange like the one you have here, they can be yellow, they can be solid black, they can even be pink. These are large moths and they're always a really good time to see. This subfamily also includes the genus Zolly. The first image here is a Zolly. These have really widely spread wings, scalloped wing margins, and um, that kind of wavy tree bark like pattern. These are really distinctive. Okay, we're moving to a new family. I believe this is the last family I have to explain to you all. And it's, I believe our largest family. It's called Noctuidae. They're medium in size and they're very diverse but there are a couple things that can help you identify them. They're often narrowly triangular, so um, the sides of the triangle are pretty long and the base of the triangle is more narrow than some of the other triangular moths we've looked at. They also have what's called a reniform spot. So um, these spots can also be incomplete, but on each of the moths here I have traced the reniform spot in yellow to highlight what we're looking at. These are um, kidney shaped. So think about a kidney bean. Um, what will help you remember this is the word reniform uh, shares a root with the word renal. So if you think about renal failure, kidney failure, um, reniform spots are these kidney shaped spots on the wing. Uh, there are moths in other groups that will have this, but if you see this reniform spot and this narrowly triangular form, you might be looking at a noctuid. 
It's a very large family and these are very common. Some of the moths in this family are called dagger moths. The second image here, this gray uniform moth is a dagger. And you know, it might also help you to recognize them if you think about a dagger shape. It's somewhat dagger shaped. I realized that was a ton of information and um, I certainly don't expect anyone to memorize all of this uh, at this point, but just the more moths you can look at, the better you'll get at figuring out what family they should be in. The biggest moth in Kentucky is the Cecropia moth, which is the species on the far right here. Um, I can look for you right now and see just how big it gets. Uh, you know, I've never seen one myself. Um, they're not terribly uncommon, but they don't come to light. So I can't lure them to me, which is why I have not seen one. The wingspan can be, according to the Peterson book, anywhere from 110 to 150 millimeters. So we're talking at a maximum size hovering around, uh, 15 centimeters. So it's a, it's a large moth, maybe that big wingspan. Uh, they're, they're really impressive. Yeah, some people do have better luck finding those as caterpillars. I have seen them as a caterpillar now that you mentioned that, um, but I've never seen an adult. Good question. Um, somebody has asked if all moths feed only on nectar. Um, no. Moths and butterflies too feed on um, a variety of things. The, the thing that's coming to mind for me that's not nectar is there's a rather rare butterfly in Kentucky called the oak hair streak. And for a long time, we thought, we assumed it was uh, feeding on nectar but there has been some relatively recent research that has come out that shows that they are actually nectaring uh, or um, feeding on liquid produced by insect galls high up in trees, which is really fascinating. Now, not all moths even eat as adults. Some moths never eat as an adult. It's actually pretty common. And these moths won't even have mouth parts. They're just completely missing. Um, and these moths, Basically, when they emerge from their pupa, they mate and then they die. That's it. They don't even eat. That's, that's actually pretty common. Um, an insect gall is um, a swelling on a tree. Um, I wish I had a photo, but um, they're usually made by wasps, so not the kind of paper wasps you get in your houses or anything like that. Different kinds of, of wasps that you rarely encounter unless you're looking for them. And they will cause a light injury to a twig um, or a leaf and they will um, lay their eggs in that little wound they made on the plant and um, the tree has an immune response that causes that area where it was wounded to swell, sometimes into a ball-like shape, a spherical mass on the twig. And so basically these wasps are really cool because they make a little house for their eggs to live in out of the swelling in the tree. We also have somebody asking if the wavy tree bark patterns correspond to the trees they evolved with. That's really interesting. Um, that's a really interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, reaching way back into my intro to biology knowledge, I remember learning about a moth. I want to say it was Biston betularia, but I could be wrong. It's like the peppery moth or something like that, where they did a study on it in Europe. Um, they surveyed the moth in regular woods, and then they also surveyed the moth in woods that were really close to a huge factory that was putting out a lot of soot. And um, 
they found that within a, a very small number of generations, the moths in the forest closest to the factory that had a ton of soot um, on the trees, they were already seeing significantly higher numbers of dark colored individuals on those sooty trees, um, whereas the, the ones in the forest far away from the factory were lighter. I'm probably not telling that right. It's been years since I thought about that. Um, yes, peppered moths. That sounds right, Emma. Um, I don't know if anyone has specifically looked at um, individual tree species um, because most moths will perch on any kind of tree. I can't think of any that would only perch on one type of tree. Um, you know, if you, if you scare a moth and it starts flying around, it'll eventually land on um, any tree that's nearby as long as they don't detect some kind of predator or other unsuitable condition. I'll go back to the beginning here so you can see my email address again if you're interested in writing that down. So it's just shelby.fulton at ky.gov. Shelby, we will be getting that video. It may take a couple of days, but we can send it out to everyone who's registered for this. Great. Webinar. And of course, if you think of any questions later that you wish you had asked, feel free to just send me an email. Um, oh, I'm glad you guys had a good time. I know it's a lot of information. Um, so this is just an introduction to some of the amazing diversity we have here. Thank you, Shelby. That was really great. Yeah, I'm glad you all enjoyed it. I always enjoy giving talks like this. So we can hang out for maybe a couple more minutes until 3.30 or so to see if anybody has any questions that are coming to mind. Um, but other than uh, that, somebody asked what my favorite moth is. Oh, boy. oh man, that's really hard. It changes all the time. Uh, I, I will say that I have a particular soft spot for any of the moths that are green. Uh, we have very few moths that are, well, I shouldn't say very few. We, green moths are not as abundant as, say, brown or gray moths. So when they come in green, that's always something I get excited about. I am also a huge advocate of little tiny moths that may be easily overlooked, particularly those little crambids I mentioned that come in metallic gold. I think they're great. They're really tiny and it's easy to overlook them, but if you look closer, they can be really beautiful. Do I photograph without a flash or with a flash? Um, no, but the camera I use for work has um, an LED ring around the lens and I have that turned on. So when I go to take a photo, uh, the LED lights up the subject for me, but I don't use a, a flash. Um, tips for somebody who wants to get into entomology. Um, there are a lot of different paths to get there. I will say I do not have a degree in entomology and I have taken one formal entomology class ever and it was a forest entomology class about pest species. Um, so, you know, I took a pretty indirect route to get to being an entomologist. Like I said, I came here by way of bats, actually. Um, I would say my best tips for someone who's wanting to get into entomology would be to figure out who's doing work in your area, and you already have made a good start, because you know me, and I know um, plenty of other really cool people who are doing work with insects in Kentucky um, that I could pass on to you. I would say 
use resources like iNaturalist to get your own observations out there. Um, there are a couple people that I've met through iNaturalist just because they posted so many cool moth photos that um, I didn't know their real name, but I knew their screen name and I'd reached out to them and chatted with them on iNaturalist. So that, that's a really great resource for networking too. Um, my other tip for somebody who wants to get into entomology is you don't have to spend a whole lot of money. Uh, professional entomologists have all kinds of cool and crazy gear, all kinds of nets, all kinds of whatever, but you don't have to um, make a large investment to get really into this hobby and profession. You can start with a lot of the DIY things I recommended here. Any cheap kids, kids net even. Um, I know people who use nets they got for their kids ages ago as part of like National Geographic toy science sets. So um, it doesn't have to be a huge investment. The citizen science activities that are typically done during Moth Week involve doing a lot of the things I talked about today with an illuminated moth sheet, but this is a really weird year for Moth Week because of COVID-19. So in the past, we've done our Moth Week event at Floracliff where um, we would have done this presentation um, in person around dinner time, and then um, we would have gone out at sunset and looked at moths together. Obviously that can't happen this year, and I'm guessing a lot of places are gonna be doing webinars. Uh, and we're also encouraging people to make their own DIY moth sheet um, to get some cool observations of moths for the event. And like I said, if you post photos on iNaturalist, they will automatically be added to the National Moth Week project. So the coordinators of National Moth Week will have access to the data that way. Do moths that don't have mouth parts still pollinate? No, they do not. Um, there's a common misconception that all moths are pollinators, um, which is not the case. There are many moths that are not pollinators at all. Uh, and there are many more moths that are maybe pollinators, but certainly not efficient pollinators in the same way that something like a sphinx moth or a bumblebee would be. All right, it looks like that might be all the questions we have. So thank you all for joining us today. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Thanks, Shelby. That's yeah, great. thank you all for having me. All right, see you all next time. Bye.